One of my earliest moments of impact was when I heard Yes, that's me. That's me. Firstborn son of Croatian immigrants dreaming of being a rock star. Well, you see how far I got with that, but yeah, you have to admit the black shoes and the white socks is a look, all right? Okay, all right. Thank you. Um, so listen, my parents worked really hard. Okay. My parents worked very hard to buy us a house in Queens, New York. But when I was seven years old, I was sad to leave my friends. Yeah, I found myself suddenly in a new neighborhood and quite lonely. I spent the first few days roaming up and down the block trying to find some kids to play with until I heard a strange sound coming from the basement of a nearby house. I went to that window and I sat, and what I heard then would change my life forever. Okay. Thank you for indulging me, yes. Okay. So I sat at this window, and all of a sudden, this teenage boy comes up from behind me, and he says, hey, kid, what are you doing there? I, I gulped. I said, I I'm just listening. He goes, you like that music? I said, it sounds great. And the next thing I knew, he and his brother and a few other kids from the neighborhood who played in a band took me under their wings like a mascot. They taught me how to play the guitar. Charlie even loaned me his amp. I was in heaven. But then one day, I knew something was off when Charlie offered to sell me his amp worth $300 or more for 20 bucks. The sad fact was that Charlie needed money for heroin. Charlie died at the age of 24, and his brother Terry died of HIV AIDS a few years later, related to drug use. Another friend overdosed about a year later, and Jeff, who also played in the band, started selling and using drugs and getting arrested. He's now in Rikers Island, and his brother, is still using today, living in his parents' garage. But he's not alone. 25 million people in our country are addicted to drugs or alcohol, and they cost our society $215 billion in healthcare costs each year. The sad fact is, is I don't think there's anyone in this audience who's not touched by addiction in one way or another. And not a week goes by that I don't get a call from a parent that goes something like this. Our daughter, Jen, she's gotten involved with drugs. She's a good kid, she's a college freshman, she's a Division I basketball player, but her friends found her on the side of the road last weekend and took her to the emergency room. They told the doctors that she'd been drinking and smoking pot, but later we found out that she's been using heroin, molly and cocaine. We don't know what to do. Jen's mother proceeded to ask me the same questions that many desperate and confused people have asked me over the years. Should we do an intervention to get her to go to treatment? After hearing the facts, I said, no, as I often do. Should we send her to rehab? Doesn't that look nice, right? <laughs> send her away, and she'll get fixed, and she'll come back. How couldn't she at such a beautiful place? Well, again, after hearing their story, my answer was no. They said, well, should we just send her to AA meetings? Once again, as you might guess at this point, my answer was no. Why was I saying no to the things that most people in our society think are absolutely necessary for someone in Jen's situation? And perhaps you're even thinking that they should be happening for her. Well, the science simply tells us otherwise. Okay, so why did I say no to an intervention? Well, you can imagine it. You've seen it, I'm sure, on TV. They fly in grandma from Florida, they pull their son out of college, they assemble a number of family members and friends to confront Jen about her drug use, to coerce, coerce her into treatment and to tell her that she has to go. How well is that gonna work? What do you think? Well, statistically, it doesn't work well. Only about 20% of people go to treatment when they're intervened with in this way. Now, let's say Jen's family hits the jackpot. It's possible, after all. Let's say Jen goes to treatment. 
They're exhaling now. They're relieved. She's safe. She's in good hands. But unfortunately, the science again tells us that she's likely to leave. About 80% do so before treatment is over. Now, how about rehab? Why did I say no to rehab? Let's imagine Jen even goes willingly to rehab, and they don't need an intervention. Well, the science again tells us that 90% of rehabs do not use scientifically supported treatments. That may come as a surprise to you, but we simply do not have true scientific data on how well rehabs work. Yes, they tout very high success rates, and some of them say 90% of people recover, but it's important to know that those studies are based on very small numbers of ex-patients, usually the ones who did well. It's very biased data that would not be uh, permissible in even our most lenient of scientific journals. On top of that, the cost is prohibitive for most people, $25,000 at a minimum. Okay. Now, how about AA? Why did I say no to AA? Well, most people think that AA is treatment, but in actuality, it's not. Anyone in an AA meeting will tell you it's what? Self-help. It's not treatment. Even though AA also touts very high success rates like the rehabs, their data, too, is based on very biased samples of people, people who go to meetings all the time and adhere to all 12 steps. Now, that's, that's great if it works for them, but that accounts for a minority of people who are involved in AA. Okay, so it doesn't really fit what we do in research studies. In fact, one researcher from Harvard recently applied our rigorous standards to AA's success rates and found an estimated rate of a mere 10%. Okay, so I'm, I'm not bashing AA. I've known many people to recover with its help. I've heard the stories, as probably you have. But our family members who have addiction deserve more than successful anecdotes and self-help to recover from their addiction. My premise here is that we need scientifically supported treatments, and AA simply isn't that. So what did I suggest that Jen's family do? I suggested that instead of an intervention, they would do family training, which gets people to get, go into treatment 64% of the time. And remember now, that was versus the 20% of interventions. What goes into family training? Well, among a number of things, families are taught how to communicate with their loved one. And instead of confronting them about their addiction, they're taught a communication strategy called motivational interviewing. And I'll share a little bit of that with you. So Jen's mom wanted to motivate her to go into treatment, right? And perhaps you're thinking of someone you'd like to motivate. So follow along. We taught Jen's mom to ask Jen, imagine we asked you to just see an addiction specialist for one session. How ready might you be to do that? And we instructed Jen's mom to ask her on a scale of 1 to 10, where 1 is not ready at all and 10 is totally ready. Now, Jen was kind of angry, right, about the intervention, about what happened, but she also knows she's in big trouble. So Jen said a 3. Now, what would you all want to say if your daughter said, on a scale of 1 to 10, I'm a 3 for going to just one session? Are you kidding? Just a 3? You were found on the side of the road. You could have been killed. Why not a 10? What would Jen say if we asked her that? She'd throw every rationalization in the book at her mom. Oh, it wasn't that bad. It never happened before. I can stop at any time. That simply doesn't motivate people. I know it's very satisfying to ask people why they're not more motivated, but it doesn't work. So instead, we trained her to ask, hey, that's a, that's a three. That's 30% there. Why didn't you say a lower number? Yes, you heard me, a lower number. So we caught Jen's attention now. And she's being uh, encouraged to ask why she has any motivation at all. So the question is, why didn't you pick a lower number? And what Jen said was the beginning of her motivation to change, was the beginning of her recovery. She said, well, sometimes I just can't keep myself from overdoing it. And the next day, I regret stuff that I did the night before. Okay, so what did I recommend instead of rehab? Intensive outpatient treatment. Treatment that is based on scientifically supported medications and psychotherapies. Now, how do we know these things work? We know they work because they're put to a very difficult test, a very rigorous standard. 
because when we do studies, we include all the dropouts, not like OAAA and the rehabs did it. All the dropouts are counted as failures. Everyone who's been assigned to a given treatment but never went to a single session or never took a single pill, all of their data is counted also. So we know that if our treatments work, that they really work. We also use urine toxicology tests and other kinds of ob objective lab measures to make sure that someone isn't using not just what they tell us. And we use medications such as naltrexone for alcohol and buprenorphine for opioids. The psychotherapies we use, for example, are cognitive behavioral therapy and family training, like I told you about, and motivational interviewing. And with this complement of treatment, we get up to nearly 80% success and at a tiny fraction of the cost of inpatient rehab. Okay, so what, what happened to Jen? Jen got intensive outpatient treatment. She did not get an intervention, she did not go to rehab, and she did not go to AA. She got the full complement of intensive outpatient services, the psychotherapy, the medications, and she also got a recovery coach instead of AA. Now, what's a recovery coach? A recovery coach is a professional who learns scientifically supported coaching strategies to get people into treatment and to get them back. Their success rates are 65% of people get into treatment and 70% get back into treatment if they drop out or if they have a relapse. Now, these are professional coaches, mind you, not peer coaches, who can be helpful, but professional coaches are trained in scientifically supported strategies and they don't just help someone based on how they recovered or the 12 steps, they base it on empirical evidence. They're also very helpful for families who are looking for scientifically supported treatment in their area, which can be a challenge at times. And finally, they can serve as a professional sponsor to be there in a time of crisis or to just answer a text if someone's having a hard day. Okay. So Jen, I'm happy to report, had a stunningly successful experience in intensive outpatient treatment. She went back to college the very next semester. She started playing basketball again, and I'm happy to report that today, a number of years later, she's in graduate school and in long-term recovery. Now, how do I know this? How do I know how to do this? Well, 17 years doing research at Yale on medications and psychotherapies is very, very helpful, but I can tell you the best experience I got in figuring out what to do for our our addicted loved ones is back here, back in the Bronx, about 20 years ago when I was a brand new psychologist. I was very motivated, very green, and I wanted to change the world. Okay, but I even, I, I loved the hospital where I worked and I even loved the neighborhood where it was. Maybe some of you know it, Arthur Avenue, the little Italy of the Bronx. So I just, I loved it there and was ready to take on the world. But one day when I got to work, I saw many of our staff standing in front of the entrance of the hospital. And so I go over to my unit chief and I said, what's going on? And he says, look up there. That's your patient on the ledge of that building threatening to jump. My heart started pounding. I said, what should I do? Who should I talk to? And I still get chills when I talk about it to this day. Uh, he looked me dead in the eye and said, ah, don't worry about it. He's not gonna jump. Just go to the ER and start working up our patients. Could you imagine? I was in shock, so I dutifully listened and I went to the ER, but on that day, I could only hear doctors and patients arguing. Above the moans and groans of pain in the ER, doctors were saying, why didn't you take your medication? What's wrong with you? You're gonna die, and patients countering, you don't know me, how can you talk to me like that? I don't need that medication. It was then that I had another moment of impact. I had been speaking to that poor man on that ledge in much the same way several weeks earlier. It was right then and there that I realized we needed to change the way that we spoke to patients if we ever were going to have a chance of motivating them to change. So our colleagues and I decided to do the first study of motivational interviewing with these severely mentally ill and addicted patients to see if we could just get them to go from the hospital to their outpatient clinics. And the study was a stunning success. We increased the rate two and a half times over the standard, more confrontational strategy. Now, and not only that, it got me a nice job at Yale, so, and <laughs> speaking here at TED. Um, 
So with the right help, people can recover. We know this. The science tells us this. But only one out of every 10 people with an addiction gets any treatment at all, and fewer still get scientifically supported treatment. That's why my mission is to go around the world and tell people about these treatments and to let them know what the science says. And in fact, that one day brought me to Eric Clapton's Crossroads Rehab in Antigua, where I sat out, looked out the window at the waters of Half Moon Bay, playing this song on one of Mr. Clapton's guitars. My friends not only instilled in me a love of rock and roll, but a drive to help other people who had their problems so that they might not suffer their fate, and to let as many people know as possible what the science tells us is good treatment. With their memory and their impact in my heart today, I'm inspired to arm you with the knowledge that with the right help, the impact of recovery can be yours as well. Thank you.